public is not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby on the audience for guest form and follow the information on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budgets, make policy, and provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to learn, maintain a safe and secure environment, mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. These are our core values, and we appreciate your interest in the students at CISD. All right, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance done by the Fannin students. So if y'all would come up here, please. Let us pray. Our Lord, our provider and our protector, God of all wisdom and God of all grace, thank you for this board. Thank you for this meeting. Dear God, would you please guide this board with your wisdom, with grace, with clarity. Lord, please protect our children. Please lead these decisions for the sake of the little ones. We ask for your hand and your guidance. Only you, dear God, and we thank you for all the service of every member of this board and everyone here. Bless them and strengthen them. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Merrill, do we have any audience for guests? All right. We'll move right into the superintendent's report. Okay, we have one new date announcement. I hope everyone will note this date, September 30th, Friday, from 5.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. CISD is inviting the community to join us as we host our first Celebrando Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, we are very excited about this. We're going to have um, parents versus students soccer games, music, food, arts and crafts. Um, this is going to be a wonderful celebration and we are just really excited to have everybody in the community come out and enjoy that with, that with us. Um, Carroll Elementary made science extra fun. We want to thank them for um, including Jeff Ray, our, the meteoro meteorologist from CBS 11, who came and visited with the students and did science and meteor meteorology demonstrations. Um, I saw that on social media. It looked like a lot of fun. Also, Navarro Elementary had a fun run. The money raised goes back to the teachers and the students. This was very well attended and was also a very fun event. They had also a drive through parade for our first responders and donations from the parade will be given to all first responders. The senior goal cards are back. If you're a senior in Navarro County, and that's defined as 65 or older, you can now Please, please, we want you to come and get one of the senior goal cards. Members of the community complete a form that's found on the website, and they come into the administration office, and um, there's a short form that Ms. Johansson will help you then, and you'll get the senior goal card, which will allow you to enter into Corsicana events, excluding football, um, for free. 
Our Tegger football plays Ennis this Friday night at home at 7 o'clock. And before that, you should go and see our Tiger volleyball players play Forney. Um, I think their games, the first um, volleyball game starts at 5 o'clock. We want to congratulate our cross-country students. They had a really great um, cross-country event. We had three students medal and 29 personal records broken. So congratulations to all our students. All right. <clears throat> uh, Jared, would you do the call and scholarship report, sir? Casey's going to hand those out. Thank you, Dr. Frost and trustees. Uh, Casey's going to cover the investment part. I'm going to cover the asset part, answer any questions. Uh, hopefully you all know I need to get Brad with Brad. Hopefully you received the fiscal year statement. Uh, Kathy's already asked some questions. If you have any questions, we'll answer that. But I'll cover the asset part, income part, and kind of where things stand to date. So I'm going to hand it over to Casey. Well, uh, good afternoon. I hope that uh, it's good to see us. It's, it's certainly good to see you all again. Uh, if you remember from our last meeting, we reported as of June 30th, so obviously a little bit of time has passed since then. I'm gonna do my best to highlight any important changes that we saw throughout the months of July and August. Uh, of course, I'm gonna do my best to respect your time and uh, hopefully make this pretty quick. But uh, with that being said, I'm going to cover the first few pages and then I'm gonna hand it back over to Jared. If you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to ask. But I'm gonna jump right in. On page one, you can see that Cash and cash equivalents made up just less than 4% of your overall portfolio, which was roughly about $700,000. 42.8% of your portfolio was made up of taxable bonds at just over seven and a half million. US equities has fallen below 50% of your overall market value with international equities making up the remaining 3.75% of, of your total portfolio. At the bottom of the page, you can also see that your ending market value as of August 31st was $17,502,000 with a gross of fees fiscal year to date return of negative 12.69%. On page two, you can also see uh, your net contribution and withdrawals information as well as administrative fees. Looking at your withdrawals is actually a great way to see what kind of activity is going on within the account. Um, of course, this is net, so it does take into account you know, all income from the mineral portfolio. Uh, any additional administration fees, and then of course what we pay out in scholarships. Year to date, uh, for calendar year to date I should specify, we've actually paid out $407,000 in Collins scholarship funds, and that's something that Jared's gonna speak on in a little bit greater depth as well. Moving ahead to page three, you can see trailing return information for your portfolio going back a little bit more than 10 years. More importantly, you can see your portfolio's return in comparison to the applicable benchmark. Stock performance has been mixed recently. Of course, we had a very good July, uh, surprisingly good, returning about 9%, although the story for August was a little bit different and gave up about half of that. In fact, as of August 31st, the S&P 500 is actually down a little bit more than 17% this year. International exposure has also uh, been relatively unsuccessful. Uh, and obviously that's going to be from the myriad of economic difficulties and global tensions that we've seen arise in foreign markets. Combining that with a double-digit decline in fixed income has made for what has now been called historically the most difficult investing environment that we may have ever seen. Right now, so much of the volatility in the American market has really been dominated by low investor confidence, and really that's stemming from whether or not the Fed can successfully navigate this oncoming recession. With that being said, we refer to this as sticking the landing. Uh, over the last 70 years, the Fed has successfully stuck the landing about three times, so it certainly makes sense that it would cause for some concern. With that being said, Fed Chair Jerome Powell has made a statement saying that the Fed is committed to rate hikes and that they will continue until, quote, the job is done he also moved on to say that it will most likely cause some pain to households and business. In the last 60 years, um, this is something that we, again, have never seen. So we're doing our best to monitor it. And of course, uh, it's an ever-changing environment. But uh, 
What is most important regarding your portfolio though, although obviously the economy has been in better condition, is that your portfolio is specifically set up so that it can mitigate these kinds of risks. Your portfolio value tends to beat growth nine times out of 10 in these situations. And what's really nice about that is because we've built a very well diversified portfolio with income favoring uh, stocks as opposed to growth favoring, um, we're actually in a relatively decent position moving forward. And that's again something that Jared's gonna talk about with the income that the, uh, that the portfolio has been producing for our scholarship funds. At the bottom of the page, you can see that your one year return was negative 9.38%, which actually beat the blended benchmark by roughly 2.9%. Uh, but with that being said, uh, I think it's probably a good time. If y'all would flip to page 13, I'll invite Jared back up here to discuss the income situation for the Collins portfolio. So years like like we're seeing this year with all the volatility, Mr. Collins knew what he was doing when he was investing in oil and gas property. And so that's, that's why that is such a valuable asset for the scholarship fund. We've seen uh, the value of the overall scholarship drop from over 20 million down to the 17 and a half million range, but your income is up substantially from where it's been the last few years. So you don't have to alter your approach in any way. And so you're really well positioned to continue doing what you're doing uh, even going into the spring. Uh, looking at uh, a dive into the assets, uh, Casey had mentioned you have 657000 in cash. 636000 of that is readily available for scholarship distributions. In addition, 636000 In addition to that, we've also invested 570000 in short duration fixed income securities. So in reality, as far as income for scholarships, you have over 1.2 million. And so that's a, a, that's a stable figure. It's been that way for the last several years. So as you continue to increase your scholarship distributions going forward, if oil prices remain elevated, which I don't have any reason to think they won't for quite some time, your income is gonna be in, in a strong position. Uh, since February, we've brought in about $27,000 a month in oil and gas income. Uh, not quite to where it was back in 2011. Uh, still haven't seen production come all the way back. Uh, I know I've referenced this in the past. It, the checks typically are about six to nine weeks behind where oil prices are. It's been pretty stable, so I think we're in a kind of a comfort zone where that 27,000 figure is gonna be the bare minimum. I think it could even go higher, so. a uh, Really well positioned there. Uh, interest rates have continued to rise, so the cash you do have is actually a, an earning asset again. You know, for several years it was 0.03, right now it's around 227. Probably in the next couple of weeks the Fed's going to increase another 75 basis points, so uh, in reality in about another month or so you're looking at around 3% just on cash. And their goal is to get it up to 4% and they want to keep it there for quite some time, and so you're not punished like you were when we had this discussion back in January, it's a, you're in good, good shape there. And so if there are any questions, I know you've gotten your statements, uh, answered some of, some of Kathy's questions about how the process was currently working. It's really, really pretty seamless from our end. You're not doing nearly as many checks as you were a few years ago. Um, we get all of that coming through Brian, administrators sending it through Brian and we're processing uh, we've been able to catch checks that were either lost in the mail or were not quickly. Uh, we had one a few weeks ago where a student uh, had inquired about their check because the university's letting them know that that check hasn't come in. Well, we pulled up the account and it actually had cleared. They were just slow in processing it. And so that does happen, And but it's good to know that that check number comes in handy because we can quickly identify if it had been processed. I know y'all got a big, big stack of statements. <laughs> it's a lot to take in, especially on the mineral side. Yeah. 
we've had some new activity out in West Texas. Uh, hasn't necessarily paid off in a big way yet, but it's uh, hopefully we will over over time. Yeah, I mean we've been in a really low rate environment for the past several years, and that's while oil and gas income was not what it was, and it's still kind of hovered in that 1.2 to 1.5, 1.6 range. And so right now, I think we're projecting income to be about 650,000. I think it's a pretty conservative estimate. It could be higher than that. And so uh, I think that 1.2 figure is going to hold f for quite some time, especially when it, rates keep going up. That certainly helps. Is that number actually stated like 1.2 in this document? It's, it's not. Um, on the statements you get, you see income cash there. And I can highlight the securities just for your record that are invested income. We do have a, it's a federal home loan bank uh, security, matures in two years. Uh, we got 100,000 in that. And so as that money, what happens is when that matures, it's gonna get swept right back into your income. And so that's why when I say 1.2 million on your statement, you'll see 636,000, but you've got those securities that will eventually mature and that money will go right back into income. income. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's uh, it's going to be more on your statement side. Do you have your statement with you? Yep. If you go to the holdings, you'll see the breakdown between income and principal on cash. Is there any way on our statements to um, add a column for the gains and losses? Can we add that in on the statement? Yeah. So that we can see that? See. I, I mean, I see it here, but we don't have Yeah, it'll be an un unrealized gain-loss yeah. column. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see if we can fit it in. We'll try to fit it in on there. Do you happen to know what we paid out for for fall semester tuition? Going back to July, we had paid out, and this is as of July 1st through today, it was 249000 roughly. And I'm sure you probably still have some that you're processing for fall. But I think that's the bulk of it has been has been processed. Um, Mr. President, just for those that might be watching and, and not know the history of this, um, we're so thankful to Mr. Collins and for um, leaving the CISD school board. Um, this money to to give to our children. I mean, the, the difference that he has made over the last what's it 70 years now? Yeah, so going almost back 70 to years. The 1950s. Yeah, has has 50s. just been um, incredible. If not one of the top scholarships in the nation, actually, and we're so lucky that. Yeah, I don't think there's many that have an individual scholarship. Fund. Absolutely. I mean, school districts have this, and it just you know having that oil and gas property sure mm -hmm. sure comes in handy and, mm -hmm. and it's helped that fund continue to grow over the time so he we're we're thankful that community national bank has this in place and we're able to continue with these scholarships for 70 years is really pretty incredible and that there is this kind of a balance left in there i know that that doesn't always happen either yes, you know it's, we've it's, been it's very good being diligent fiscally responsible uh, mm -hmm. you know We've, we've discussed about transitioning over time to a method where you're maybe you're spending a percentage of the market value um, on a year like this year it wouldn't impact you at all because your income is up right. so much and so when we go back to that period where rates are low oil and gas income is low market strong you can take advantage of that too so you're really in a, a really good position I know it's a, a bit of a headache sometimes it's a fund that just continues to grow mm -hmm. Doing well, 70 years from now, they may be doing the same thing, right? I hope so. I hope so. Thank you, Jared. Thank you all. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate it, Jared. And Casey. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Now we're moving around to the wraparound resources update. Thank you, Dr. Frost, board president, and distinguished members of the board. 
My name is Kimberly Procell, and I am the Wraparound Specialist for Corsicana ISD. Um, so the purpose of my presentation today is to provide you all with an update on uh, wraparound services and then a couple of things that we have coming up that I am excited to share. So for those who are not yet um, familiar with wraparound services, this is an initiative that we started in January of this year of 2022. And it is a program to ensure that all of our students come to school ready to learn, despite the fact that they may not have everything that they need for school at home. And so I think that all of us in this room can understand that if a child is coming to school tired or hungry um, or cold, um, they're not going to function well in school. They're not going to have a good day. They won't be successful. And so that is where wraparound services comes in. So some of the non-academic supports that are provided by wraparound services are um, needs such as school uniforms, shoes, hygiene products. We have a small food pantry there available for students and families as well. Um, there are, there, there's a number of needs that, um, that students are calling about, that their families are calling about. And so this is just what we have for starters. I would love to grow this program to where we offer um, even more uh, classes for parents as far as, you know, filing taxes, um, writing checks even now, um, creating emails. We have several families who have had a hard time, um, you know, even logging into to Canvas, for example. They don't know how to create an account. So classes like that, I would love to have um, prepared for, for families in the future. And ways that services can be requested through Wraparound, um, there are several. So on the Corsicana ISD webpage, there is a Wraparound Services page um, that contains, there is a little, the yellow arrow that points to where the student assistance form is. Um, it's referred to as a SAF, just for short. Uh, we have that on the CISD webpage. And in the front office of every campus is a wraparound services flyer that includes the QR code for families and even students in middle and high school. They can scan the, the QR code, answer a eight question um, assistance form letting us know what kind of assistance they need. And that form goes straight to my email. That way I can open it up right away, contact that family and find out what their needs are. And then also they can just call the wraparound office directly at 903-602-8126 and they can just explain over the phone what their need is if they don't have access to internet and, and those kinds of things. So I wanted to take a second and share um, just a couple of numbers that I thought were, were pretty amazing for just starting a program like this um, here at Corsicana ISD. So the first number that you're gonna look at here, um, it says number of SAFs received, so the number of student assistance forms that we received um, from January until now. And um, just to kind of give a little bit of clarification, I did not start to receive very many um, assistance forms until about February, whenever people started to learn about what wraparound was and kind of getting the word out a little bit more. So we have received 179 SAF reports. Um, and so it kind of breaks it down, the first pie chart breaks it down by how many students we provided services for. So there are families, of course, you can see 43% of those um, were families with just one student, 46% were families with two to three students that we were providing services for. And then the 11% are families with four or more students. The second pie chart that you see right below that um, will break it down by what type of assistance we provided. Um, and so what's listed on the student assistance form are services such as school uniforms, food assistance, school supplies, mental health referrals, and other. And so as you can see, the largest portion of that was a need for school uniforms, which was about 57% of the forms that we received. Um, food assistance was a 9%. School supplies was at a 13%. Mental health referrals is, is the smallest one, it's 2% and then other carried 19%. So whenever we're looking at other, you know, what, what kind of services is that? So 
That has been utility assistance. We have families calling um, because their lights got cut off or their water got cut off. They're, they're behind on their rent. So I can make referrals to the community to help provide um, assistance for that. Um, legal help, um, emergency housing. I've helped connect students with the Texas Workforce Commission uh, for job employment, job training, and things like that. Um, and so, I'm sorry, one more thing. So the number of students based on our previous 179 forms that we received is showing that we have served approximately 330 students um, so far with wraparound. And then some upcoming events that I would like to share. So the student support counselors here at Corsicana ISD and Wraparound have partnered together to put together parent workshops. It's called Family Matters, and those actually start tonight at 5.30 at Drain. We have um, several topics that we're gonna discuss, and these go throughout the rest of the school year. So our session tonight is actually about who parents need to talk to at the school for different services. Um, wraparound services is one thing that we'll discuss tonight at, at that parent workshop as well. We have um, workshops on mental health for teens, parents, um, self-care for parents, um, drug prevention, you know, kind of explaining to parents what the new trends are, things to look for, and also um, social media, new apps, you know, how, how kids are hiding those apps now, what to look for, how to lock things, stuff like that. And so these, these workshops are actually geared more toward uh, families of teens. Um, but any family is, for the social media one especially, um, we're inviting all families because we know kids as young as eight have a cell phone. And so we want to be able to educate families on, you know, things they may find on, on phones, on social media, through apps and things like that. Um, we will also be, um, and this is something that's in the works, a clothing drive with our biggest need being adult sizes in clothes and shoes. Over the last over the last month and even back in May, I had several, several families calling requesting adult size clothes. Um, and so that has been our biggest need and that is what I really want to focus on for this next clothing drive that will be at the end of September. Um, and so we'll have, you know, our campuses participating in that. So that's coming up. And then down here on the bottom of this, of this slide, there is a, a career closet. So this is where another area that I would love to expand um, wraparound services. So I had a couple of community members before school got out last year that brought in some pantsuits um, that they weren't using anymore. So I kept those and then thought, how great of an idea would it be to have a career closet at Wraparound for students who are getting ready for job interviews, um, job fairs, college interviews even. And so I wanna be able to have that opportunity for students to come pick out clothing for their job interviews um, because it's hard to purchase those types of clothes um, for students, especially on a high school budget. And even families that may not be able to afford, you know, a brand new suit or dress shoes. And so once we expand that, some of the items that I would really like to receive for that would be pantsuits, um, skirt suits, nice blouses, um, shirts and ties, dress shoes, those kinds of things. Just to have something else available for students who who may not be able to, um, you know, to attend interviews because of something like that. So overall, overall the services offered through Wraparound are being utilized. Um, every day our number is growing. Um, we're able to provide all of these services to students. And I could not be more excited. I think that 330 is a really good number for a program that just started in our district. And I can only see that even doubling over the next semester. So I'm really excited about that. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Um, I was just curious with the QR code. Um, are you able to, to track, you said you get an email. Or you, does it tell you that their inquiry came through the QR code so you can track if that's 
you yes. know, if, if our um, parents and students are using that technology now, Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So once they scan the QR code and they fill out the survey, that survey goes directly to my email. I open it up and it'll have the name, what the need is, contact number, and then I make contact with the family at that time. Okay. So you're able to tell that came, that specific inquiry came from the QR code. This yes. one came from the website? Yes. Okay. Will you be sure and email us when you have specific requests? I know that I frequently um, have people in the community come up to me and say, tell me where to give, you know, tell me, tell me some needs, or especially with us coming in at the end of the year, they want to, you know, maybe make a donation for Christmas in honor of somebody or something. Sure. So I think if you would keep all of us on an email, I mean, now that I know there's a few things that you need, I, I can go out and look for those. So if you'll keep us aware of those, I, I will come in. I mean, I know, I think we all come in contact yeah. with people that are willing to help you. That would be great. Yes, okay. thank you. And then I have a question. Yes. Um, tonight's the Family Matters event. Do you know how, about how many people registered for that? We had 13 people 13. registered. Good. Mm -hmm. And we're also, so we ended the registration about a week and a half ago, and we had 13 at that time, but we're also just, you know, we accept anyone who will walk in. Right. Mm -hmm. So we won't turn anyone away. And my understanding is there's going to be a nice dinner mm -hmm. provided as yes, well, that, so that'll be fun. Be dinner, door prizes, and child care as well for all sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to consider approval of the Qualtrics data dashboard. Thank you, Board President, Dr. Foss, and distinguished members of the board. The purpose of this presentation is uh, to approve the purchase of our data dashboard. There it is. All right, here we go. So I, what is my role as a data fellow? I'm asked that quite a bit. It's a new position. I was hired in February, and I um, continued my fourth grade classroom throughout uh, until May, and then I moved into this position officially. Um, so what is my role? I am managing and creating data. Um, I am improvement cycle support. I am helping close data gaps, and I am building a dashboard, which is the purpose of this presentation. So I am working with an RSSP team, which is the Resilient School Support Program team. Um, Stephanie Howe is the lead of that, and we also have Kim Holcomb and Tim Betts and Tiffany Farmer and uh, Brittany Mathis. So we're working with um, three different elementary schools right now. So um, we also are working with a technical assistance provider which is Ed Direction. We have been on uh, Zoom calls with them since February so I feel like I've gotten to know them very well through Zoom. Um, they will be visiting Corsicana very soon to help us out. All right so moving on. Um, we actually met with or were given three different presentations for data dashboards. So the first one was EduClimber. Um, that one was very robust. It had uh, excellent um, things that we could use in our district, but very, very pricey. The next one we met with was Elevate. Um, Elevate was really good as well, but it was also super expensive and it did not have everything that we would like to see. So um, the last one we met with was Qualtrics and Qualtrics was able to provide everything that we could possibly want. Um, and it's, it's also pricey, but much better than the other two. So that's good news. So I'm gonna tell you more about Qualtrics. So it used to be that grades were the primary measure of a student's progress. But today, there's no shortage of ways that students can learn both in and out of the classroom. So when you're in the classroom, you're collecting all kinds of data constantly through common assessments, interventions, benchmarks, learning platforms, after school activities, and more. The list just continues to go on and on the amounts of data that you are provided. So we are very data rich in our district, which is a great thing. Um, but the problem is that our educators do not have access to all this information in one platform. So that's when Qualtrics would come in. So Qualtrics has, um, it will provide us with one dashboard for all of our sources of data. So it would pull everything into one, which is great. Thinking about being an educator in a classroom and you can just pull it up really quick. I can look at if I am um, on the board here, I'm able to look district wide. I'm able to look campuses. I'm able to just filter in. It's got some very great qualities that I think would help everyone in the district 
whether you're a kindergarten teacher all the way up through seniors, or if you are on a board, or you're going into a 504 meeting, if you're working with your SPED students and you're in a different, different kinds of meetings, you could just filter down to that one student. So it has really great features. Um, so we can collect student data, attendance data, survey data, behavioral data, growth data, grades, House Bill 4545, um, PLC information, walkthroughs, um, other projects that we could dive into later once we, we would start with K through four first and then we'd con continue to build onto that. So other projects that Qualtrics is capable of doing is the bullying ticketing system, which I thought was a really cool one. Um, school bonds, they can help us with that. Community feedback, student staff engagement, it has an observation tool automated ticketing and alerts. So we would get alerts if a student's dropping in their data, which is, I think is a great feature. Um, graduation surveys and alumni database, which I thought was another cool one that we might be interested in using. Um, but we have any, our, our options are unlimited. So if we can come up with it, Qualtrics can help us create, which I think is a great quality. Um, we also have unlimited users. Role-based dashboard, so if you're a principal at Navarra Elementary, you can pull up all of Navarra Elementary's data. If you are at uh, Carroll High School, wherever you may be, you will have a dashboard that's built for you. Um, and consultant-led training is something that, so they would train the trainer kind of program, so they would train me or whoever else we want to include in that, and then it would, we would train everyone else that wants to use it. So pretty neat. Um, and then, let's see, there we go. Qualtrics can help us to empower leaders and staff to drive meaningful improvements through better data-driven decisions. Um, I do have an example available if you're interested in what this could look like. Ready. All right, so if you scroll down, this is Oklahoma City. This is a public facing dashboard that they did for their website where parents are able to log on and see all kinds of information. You're able to filter down if you look up at the top, Adam, very top. Yes, and we're able to give, um, provide our own filter so we can decide what we want people to see. If we don't want to make it public facing, we do not have to. We can make it just inside the district. Um, if you click on the left side, there's some more options. So like attendance data, if you're curious about the attendance trends. Yeah, sure. And that will show you how the data looks from the years since 1930. And you're able to also filter down to different schools. It's really, really cool um, ways to see data. I think it's very important that we can visualize it, not just see all the numbers, but it's important to see what's happening. Uh, one of the things I forgot to tell you guys about, data storytelling. Very cool feature that Qualtrics provides. So let's say you're a brand new teacher. We have quite a few in the district this year that, you know, are overwhelmed with data maybe, you know. So as you're able to look at your dashboard, it will provide you with a data storytelling feature, which will help you kind of analyze the data and kind of see what's happening and why. So another feature. And then, yeah, you can just kind of click through if you want to, if anyone wants to see anything else. And this is just an example. We are provided with a few different options that they give us, or we can kind of create our own once we decide if we want to use Qualtrics. Very visually appealing. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, anyone have any questions for me? Um, I do have a question, um, which I'll actually already know the answer to, but I just mm -hmm. want you to say it. Yeah. Um, how would we um, fund this um, initiative? Ms. Howe's been working. <laughs> <laughs> I've been leaning on Ms. Howe for this part. Move some funds around and whatnot in I-53, which is technology, and I'm working with uh, Debbie Potter with federal funding, so we combined funding. <laughs> All right, does this work with Skyward or does it need to work with Skyward? Um, yeah, so um, we are working on that on figuring out how everything will get into it. So once it's, the upload will take time once we make that decision. The training will take time once we get everything started. But in the next several months, we should have a capability to get everything really flowing in. So, um, and it would update every 
Yes. Yeah, they all work together, yes. So Skyward, grades, um, attendance, um, anything basically that you can imagine, we can make it happen through Qualtrics. Yeah. One of the interesting things about, about Skyward and this is there's so many districts in Texas that use Skyward. And if, if Qualtrics wants to be marketable, and they do, and they are, um, they really have to be able to work in, to integrate with Skyward. And, and, and for those that may not know, kind of tell us why those are separate but need both needed. Because to the normal, non-tech person, explain those to us. Do you want to do it or do you want me to? Uh, it doesn't matter. I can do it. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so we have lots of different systems that we use for our data. So we have map testing, which is our beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year data, assessment data, which is very important to make sure you're using and looking at as a teacher. And then we also have DMAC, that where our weekly common assessments go into there. And then we have Skyward, which has our attendance, grading, everything like that. So all of those are very different. So if you're a teacher, you have to pull up all of those different systems to figure out what's going on, right? Then maybe you're doing your little intervention or your tutoring. You have all your little notes from that. Like it's just so many different things that you have to take in into consideration on how you're going to close gaps for that one specific child because every child's different and we have to meet every need of every child so it's just it's a very hard balance in the classroom especially if you're new and you haven't done it before and you're learning all these different programs so it's gonna it's very separate things that we need everything to flow into one to make it much easier to see exactly yes yes we can empower teachers leaders everyone to make better decisions for our students. <laughs> now that I can figure it out. I'll second. <laughs> well, we have a motion and a second to request approval for the purchase of Qualtrics Core XM Data Dashboard. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. We will, we will purchase the Qualtrics Core XM Data Dashboard. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Nelson, you going to give us an update, please, sir? Yeah. Um, ben Baker and myself went um, around with our air conditioning company and went through every campus throughout the district and uh, just basically went through and um, did a quality, you know, check how the quality of the units that we have, how old they are, uh, do they have an energy <coughs> management system, and um, these are the results that we had. Um, Bowie, um, they have about 50 units. They do not have an energy management system. And what that is, it's like a programmable thermostat that you can set it to come on and off at certain times or adjust temperatures during different times um, and also program it to change from like AC to heat during a, a 24 hour period and you can program it for a longer period of time. Um, but Bowie, um, we had one, uh, they need 49 uh, units that need to be replaced. There's um, like problems to where they're not able um, to maintain the cooling and heating of the campuses. Um, right, it's they're right about twenty thousand a unit. So for the units, how many tons for each of those units? It just depends on how many are on certain sections. Like they'll put one over every classroom, uh, and they would be like a twenty-ton unit. Uh, that m will take care of like two classrooms. A 40 ton unit would take care of like up to four. And it just, uh, it adjusts to whatever you use on the wings. And they try and do it 
um, as um, like the wings they try and get is um, so the roof will handle those because they're all rooftop units except for a few campuses right Look at what that could possibly be. Well, and the situation that we have is at Bowie, yes, we need to replace 49 of the 50 units. And what they're doing is they're fixing them. I mean, as different, a part will go out, we'll go over, we'll fix it. Been doing that for a long time now. Yes. Yeah. And so we need new units. And that's that's part of a bond. And you can see from just looking down through there that um, I mean we need a lot of new units. That really the only school that's in pretty good shape with that or re really good shape is our brand new middle school. Yes. But if you also look at, I mean, if they. Exactly, and then right, and then also your schools um, as far as uh, Sam Houston and Drain, those did not have air conditioning and heating. Right, and originally. so the units that we have placed on those are units like you and I would have in our house. Mm -hmm. And the same thing like with the admin building, mm -hmm. like we have these two units here mm -hmm. that are just like what we would have in a house that are running like this office. We have those in every one of our offices throughout this building. And the so, very old air conditioners also yeah. have the liquid that yeah. we talked about. What is it called? It's a Freon though. It's a Freon something and it's with the number. And it's becoming very hard to get right. and very expensive. Are you, yeah, they yes. Yeah, it's about fourteen hundred dollars a bottle for those. Chillers, uh, they have one at the high school, and um, and it's out by where the cafeteria in the commons area there. And then the rest of them are, are rooftop units um, throughout, like the, the gym and the new part of the campus, it's their rooftop units there. So right, just looking at that right there, we need 242 units. Right, and then you have Collins, 70 units, and then the high school, 80 units, and then Drain, um, and Drain needs like 37, and then as far as the gym, um, it's broken beyond repair, so if we were to put something in there, we would need a total new unit there. The gym at Drain. Right. The other thing that you asked Mike to look at was roofing, and we have three bids. We just received the last two this afternoon on the roofing for drain, and so we'll be able to bring to, to we haven't had a chance to analyze those. We'll bring those back to you um, at the next board meeting. But if you wanted to put a new roof on drain, you're looking at about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. 
that's just a guesstimate based on what we know what we know as of right now yeah. and we are always um, looking for possible grant opportunities um, and energy saving measures correct we are yes so we're keeping that open we understand that a bond is is the only way we're able to do it but if we could get some grants we're, we're trying correct we're trying to do that okay. yes we have grants out in a lot of different areas right now there's not a grant open for air conditioning units okay not anything like this at okay. this size okay. okay thank you mike thank appreciate you. it I don't know if I appreciate it, but uh, thank you for the information. I think we just need to call this adjourned. All right. We got the 2022-23 professional development plan. Okay, well, you will note that Ms. Holcomb is not here. She is at jury duty. She's doing her civic duty, and I asked her to do that. So I'm going to do the presentation for you. You're in luck. Or not. Can we judge her later? So I'm good. So the star redesign is um, is also a significant change. Um, we have had training and information provided to our teachers so that they're able to help our students um, make some modifications in how they learn and how they how they learn to respond to questions so that we um, meet the redesign requirements for this. Um, Kudos to Amy Kasperzik. She did our first Fine Arts Summit. They had a great time. Um, the teachers got together and they did some wonderful planning for the year. The learning labs are something that's new at, at um, Drain. It's the Gold Lab and the Blue Lab. And this is these are rooms that are set up so that either 40 or 60 teachers, depending on which lab, can come together for, the, um, for different learning and staff development. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about comp days and what our teachers do for that. As you know, this is learning that teachers um, do during either the summer or after contract hours, and they trade those for days that they're off during the calendar year, the school calendar year. Um, a lot of back to school work because, as you know, we had a lot of new teachers this year, so that made um, that incrementally more important. We have implemented Saxon Phonics K2. This is something that our teachers requested and has been uh, very well received. And then we had STEM scopes that we were using in science, and so we've added math to that. Um, just This is just a list of the requirements for all of our teachers, um, all 526 of our teaching staff. And I just made a list on this of the different credits that they have. And then on the right are the requirements for all the new teachers to CISD. And so our CNI department and um, additional staff members, um, including safety and security, Mr. Bulwer is involved, Ms. Howell is involved, Ms. Cotter and her department are involved in helping our teachers to get the required training. So here's Tiger University. They did um, some really fun things this year, very engaging things. And one of the most fun and important things they did was to bring in some of our experienced administrators and teachers and let our new teachers just kind of quiz them. They had some questions they wanted them to, to answer, but in addition, they let our new teachers just ask the things that they wanted to know as novices. It was kind of fun. Um, these are just pictures from the professional development and the orientation that were conducted in the district. Um, you can see that they're learning how to use manipulatives. They're talking about the randomization and processes, and our teachers um, were, were very well engaged. 
Um, Jane Schaefer writing is something that we have implemented in the district several years ago, but it's becoming even more critical. And so training is including our um, content area teachers, math, science, social studies, which really their focus is not to teach writing, but their focus is to um, use writing in their instructions um, knowing what to look for in student responses. And that's important because it, sh it shows thinking processes, but in addition, it teaches students how to write in the different content areas. And these are some pictures from the learning labs at Drain. Uh, the teachers are enjoying using those. They've got signage up, so they'll know where to go when they get over there. And that is the CNI presentation. I wasn't nearly as good as Ms. Holcomb would have been, but I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. All right. Thank you for that update, Dr. Frost. All right. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Do we have any additional agenda items for the 10 3 workshop? Could we get a report on our bus fleet, age, miles, numbers? Well, and um, I don't know that, well, I know they won't be in by that time, but we have a grant, a significant grant um, that will be included in that report. And maybe even our white fleet? Sure. Because it's pretty aged too. So since we've talked about aged air conditioners, mm -hmm. let's talk about our fleet. Does anyone else have anything? Okay, now we're gonna move the consent agenda. Do I have a motion for consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it, and we've approved the consent agenda. Well, now we're going to adjourn into closed session permitted by Texas Governance Code Section 551.01. Thank you.